Again, a reminder that on Monday we'll have a, the first of two midterm exams. 30 questions, multiple choice. I encourage you to take the old exams. There are lots of them on the, the main class website, the one, the one that I operate myself. Uh, as a reminder, if you're off grounds and have trouble accessing that, those tests, because I sort of keep them from being world viewable, you can get to them with a, there's a password ac accessible version of the website that I emailed you at the beginning of the semester or that, that will come up on a page saying, sorry, you can't access this. If you go to that password protected version and enter the username and password that are on Colab, the Colab site for this class, you can, you can go get in from outside the university. All right? Any questions about the exam, exam stuff? All right. What I, what I will get through today uh, is the bouncing ball stuff. And um, I intend to do a sum of carousels and roller coasters on Friday. Um, I'll try to get a video up tomorrow, maybe today. I'll, I'll work on that. All right, so, that's, so the exam will cover everything up until certainly through today and, and into this, some parts of carousels and roller coasters. All right, so the story of bouncing balls, I got, I got into that a little last time, and, and I'll, I have the video up there, and so to, just to sort of make sure it's, stuff is clear, a bouncing ball, a ball is, it, it's not exactly a spring in the sense that it doesn't obey Hooke's Law. I, years ago, my, one of my, I think the first edition of the book or something, I claimed it was a spring and, and got flack for that. It's not really spring-like, so the, the, the restoring force isn't quite, proportional to how much you dent it, which is an interesting problem, but I'll, I'll leave it. The idea is that when the ball dents during its impact with surfaces, it can store energy. Uh, it depends on the ball how well it does store energy, but certainly it has work done on it as viewed from its own center of mass. During the bounce, its, it's reference frame is messy because it's accelerating. But you can basically get the idea that, that to take the ball out of round, assuming it was a round ball to start with, you got to do work on it. And it stores energy during that process. And at least some of that energy is available during the rebound to be come back and make the ball bounce. So that's what's happening when the ball is bouncing off of a hard, rigid, immovable surface, which it doesn't really exist, but we can, we can get pretty close. And different balls bounce to different heights from which they were dropped. This, this is balls, it's coming about half height. This ball, about half height also. This ball, not. They, they, they deliberately make these balls, be, they're called happy and unhappy balls if you ever want to own one. The happy ball bounces nice, so it's happy. The unhappy ball, terrible. Um, you know. The difference between them is, is the chemistry of the, of the rubber. This one manages to store energy and return it very well. This one manages, manages to squander all that energy by, by way of sort of internal frictional effects and basically not bounce. All right? And balls in essentially all sports are regulated to have certain bounciness. If you change the bounciness of the ball, you change the sport. So if, if Anybody who's followed baseball has, has seen the discussions of juiced balls. You know, are, are the balls today, the, today the same as the balls 50 years ago? I, I know it's, these are huge controversies because they change the statistics, which are all important, of course. Um, that this, the, the unhappy ball is equivalent, really, to a bean bag. So this is our simple version of a bean bag. Again, no bounce. What else do I want to tell you about that? Okay, so the regulation idea comes about because you need some control over how bouncy a ball is to, to, to keep the sport as it is. And there are two ways, two obvious ways or simple ways to quantify the bounciness or liveliness of a ball. From a physicist's point of view, the simplest one is an energy ratio. An energy ratio between two things, and what are they? The kinetic energy the ball has right before it hits and the kinetic energy it has right after it bounces, re rebounds. And 
So as the ball falls, when I let go of it, it's, it's going to start with lots of gravitational potential energy that I invested by lifting the ball off the table. The ball will then convert that energy into kinetic energy by the time it gets down to the table. So it will have descended, lost gravitational potential energy, um, acquired kinetic energy. The sum of the two will be the same because energy is conserved and nobody's transferring energy to or from this thing. And then it hits. And when it hits, it invests all of that kinetic energy into the ball surface and comes to a dead stop. There is a moment when the ball is motionless. This, this, this assumes a straight on impact, right smack down, not at some angle. If, if there's an angle involved, life is complicated and interesting. This is, this is important in billiards and everything else. But let's just let it aside. Let's just straight at impact. The energy goes gravitational, kinetic, gone. It's not totally gone. It becomes uh, elastic potential energy in the ball surface, assuming that only the ball dented and the surface was absolutely immovable. And that energy goes into the ball's elastic potential energy and possibly thermal energy. Some of the energy might just get ground up right in the process of denting. And if, if a large fraction of the elastic potential energy comes back during the rebound, it goes back into kinetic and then goes back into, into gravitational, and the ball bounces. And the height to which it rebounds when it drops on a rigid, immovable surface. And, the, and why rigid, immovable? We don't want the ball to be able to do work on that surface. Don't, if we forbid the ball to, do, to give away any of its energy to the surface, the ball's got it. And so the ball, the, the, if the ball bounces perfectly, if it stores all of its energy as elastic perfectly, it will come right back up to its original height. Okay? Its height is proportional to it, it's, it's, I should say, its gravitational potential energy is proportional to its height. So if it comes up to full height, all the energy came back. If it comes back to half height, one half the energy came back. And so by, by measuring the, the, the height you drop it from and the height to which it rebounds, you get two energies, the before and after. And if you divide the after by the before, you get a number that is the best one. If it bounces to full height. In fact, in all, for all reasonable balls, for all real balls, it's less than one. And that energy ratio, I call that the energy ratio, between the energy after the rebound and the energy before the, the impact, that characterizes the ball's bounciness. And so this guy's got an energy ratio of about, you know, about half. The tennis ball, this one, about half. Um, sometimes you can get balls that are, that are better than that. What about a basketball? Le a little, le little less than half. Uh, a baseball is terrible. A baseball is about a quarter, maybe a, you know, a good day. And a beanbag is about a zero. All right? That, see, I mean, hopefully that, that's uh, pretty easy to follow, the idea of an energy ratio, and you just look at the rebound heights. They're easy to measure. I don't know why this wasn't the standard used in in sports, but the standard that's used in sports is called the coefficient of restitution, which is another ratio. Coefficient of restitution. I mean, words I never use. Um, it's a speed ratio. It's the ratio of the rebound speed to the, imp to the approach or collision speed. So it's, it's, again, a number that's one or less. But it's weird. You have to measure the speeds of the ball, which is not so easy to do. And so how fast is the ball moving right before it hits? Ah, I don't know. How fast is it moving after it hits? Ah, also hard to deal. But they do it, evidently. And the, the nice thing about the speed ratio as compared to the energy ratio, you, 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 you're OK with the difference between them, is they're easily, you can convert one to the other very easily. And to do that, you have to take advantage of a, of a detail that I keep forgetting to mention in class and I keep forgetting to, to mention in the, in the lecture videos. And that, that has to do with kinetic energy. I, I, I hope I've told you, and I know I've told you, I hope I've conveyed to you that what kinetic energy is, it's the energy in an object's movement. I've told, talked, I mean, the alternative is energy in the objects, in the forces between objects. That's, those are the potential energies. But the, object, the energy that's in an object's actual movement involves speed. And for a, for a simple object, a ball, for example, it's just, a, just one rigid, simple object, 
and let's not let it rotate for the moment. If you just have it moving across the room, it carries with it kinetic energy, and that kinetic energy is, is easily calculated. It actually, it, it's one half the mass of the ball times the ball's speed squared. So the, the, the energy of a moving object, like a ball, it, it, yeah, mass is involved. So obviously the, big, you know, the more mass of the object is, the more energy it, it carries. And it's just proportional. Double the mass, you double the energy. But it also has to do with the speed of the object. And not just linearly in speed, which is to say not just in proportion of speed. It's proportion of speed squared. So, an, so if you take the ball and throw it at 50 miles an hour, you give it a certain amount of energy. If you throw it at 100 miles an hour, though, you've given it four times the energy. And this is part of the reason why high school pitchers can throw 50 mile an hour fastballs, but a couple of you know, heroic professionals can throw a baseball at 100. It's way harder because the ball leaves your hands with four times the energy. Not only that, because the whole, thing, the whole movement occurs effectively twice as fast, to get it to go 100 miles an hour, all the speeds are doubled. You only have half the time to invest that energy. So if you look at the energy invested in the ball per second, a quantity that's known familiarly as power, that's what power is, it's energy per time. Um, why, yeah, I, I can go on that, I'll stop. Um, throwing a 100 mile an hour fastball involves eight times the power of throwing a, one, of a 50 mile an hour fastball. Any question about that idea? I mean, I mean some of these are just, just sort of public service now. So this is sort of why you, the speed with which you can throw stuff uh, becomes <coughs> progressively more difficult. You can't, yeah, you can go from 60 miles an hour to 70. Uh, 70 to 80, it gets harder and harder, and, and you know, it's unlikely that anybody in this century is going to be able to throw a baseball at 120 miles an hour. It's just too much energy, too much power. They'll have genetically modified people eventually that'll throw it at supersonic speeds, but that's a, a rule in the game. Okay, there'll be people with long legs that go from home, from home plate to first base without leaving. They just step around the bases and, and get home runs every time. <laughs> yeah. Oh well. What I also wanted to say in, in, in light of you know, public service announcements is because energy, kinetic energy, the energy you carry with you is proportional to your speed squared, this is why things that move fast carry a lot of energy and are more dangerous. Um, I mean, the, the, the example that comes to mind, and again, I don't want to step on anybody's personal tragedies or stuff, but, but car accidents. Car accidents at, at, say, 30 miles an hour. I mean, you know, they're not fun, but, but they're, they are what they are. 60 miles an hour, though, that's twice as fast. There's four times as much energy around. And that's a problem. And that's the reason why high speed collisions, you know, get above 60 to 70 to 80, wow, the energy involved is so huge that you don't want that energy coming into you in some unexpected way. You don't want to have work done on you. So low speeds, relatively safe compared to high speeds. And it gets bad fast with speed. Any questions about? Those ideas? I should also say that objects can have kinetic energy in their rotation as well. It also goes as angular velocity squared. So it, it, it's got another square, square showing up into it. So you know, what's the energy equation? The energy of an object, and it's in the book, the energy of an object, simple object, is its mass, is half its mass times its speed squared. You could write that as velocity squared, because in the process of, of squaring velocity, you lose direction. I, I told you, I've, I've told you many times that, that energy has nothing to do about which direction you're going. It's, it's the conserved quantity of doing things. And so a ball moving to the right at, at 60 miles an hour, and a ball moving to the left at 60 miles an hour. I never was able to catch. They have the same energy. The direction's irrelevant. Okay, uh, for rotation, it's it's similar. It's, I, I think it's rotational mass, half rotational mass times angular velocity squared. Um, another question that came in. It's worth 
saying two cents about that's related. You know, it, it's sort of, it, it's not exactly what we're doing right now, but I, I'll say anyway. You, you, you presumably d seen a lot now about things bouncing back and forth about equilibrium. And they'll keep showing up. They show up over and over in, in, in physics and in the world around us. And as a general rule, these bouncing motions are a battle between inertia, trying to make something continue doing what it was doing, and a restoring force or torque or combination, trying to return the thing to center, to the equilibrium, the point at which it's experiencing no net force or net torque, or both. And things bounce back and forth about it. You know, inertia is, is ascended at some point, and then the restoring force wins, and then back and forth. They, they fight back and forth. And there's excess energy involved in keeping the motion going. Every time the system goes through equilibrium, it has been accelerating towards that equilibrium the whole way because the restoring influence has been pushing it that way in the direction of its own travel. So it, it goes faster and faster until it gets there, and then it gets there and it's momentarily coasting, zero net, net force torque, and then it shoots through because of inertia. And once it's shot through, now it slows down because it's accelerating the, the other way. So it goes fast, slower and slower. So right at equilibrium is the peak speed, and therefore the peak kinetic energy, because after all, ener energy, it, kinetic energy is proportional to square of speed. So in these, these swinging or oscillating systems, vibrating systems, they always hit peak speed, peak kinetic energy, right at, e right at equilibrium. Uh, I will often give you questions on problem sets or exams that say, what about just before it reaches equilibrium? You, some of you have already seen these, these kinds of answers. Just, be, oh, and it's almost at equilibrium. And those answers are always intrinsically vague. What does it mean, just before? One second before? One inch before? Whatever number you come up with as a re response, I'll go halfway in between that and equilibrium, and I'll say, ha, I'm closer. Okay? So the just befores are really vague. Mathematically, you can keep slicing and get closer and closer and closer, and it never, the, the only interesting place to be is right at. Everything else is just lost in, in mathematics land. Okay? So right at equilibrium is peak speed, peak kinetic energy. All right? How about the two ends? At the ends, when you're farthest from equilibrium, those are the points when you have bent the restoring force, as, you know, the restoring force system as far out of, out of whack as it will get, it's fighting the hardest and pushing back the hardest. And so those are locations of peak restoring force or restoring torque or whatever the influence is. So those are moments when, in fact, the object comes to rest and it has no kinetic energy. The system comes to rest. No kinetic energy at all. No movement. But maximum acceleration. Biggest forces, biggest acceleration, it's trying to get back to centers as hard as it ever will. So those are points also of peak stored energy, potential energy. In a bouncing ball, when is, when is the potential energy uh, greatest and the kinetic energy greatest? In the bouncing ball, it's actually an oscillating system. It's one that, when it's going bing, 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 the ball is actually, os it, it's, it's swinging back and forth about an equilibrium. You want to see the equilibrium? There it is. The ball is right at equilibrium now. It's perfectly supported, no, no more, no less, and it's settled down with zero extra kinetic energy, zero extra potential energy. It's as low as energy as it can have. If I pull it away from equilibrium, either by going up, or by shoving it deeper in the table. Now it experiences restoring influences. It wants to go back to equilibrium. Okay? And this thing, as it bounces, and it settles too quickly to be really nice. If it were perfectly balanced, you'd be there going ding, 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 ding all day, right? And it would reach peak speed right when it hit the equilibrium, that point, and it would hit peak acceleration, top and bottom. But they're not symmetric. This, this, one's a not, this is not a symmetric uh, oscillation. The oscillations that I've done up until now were wonderfully symmetric. This guy, beautifully symmetric, top versus bottom, top versus bottom. And so the accelerations at the top and the bottom, same. This thing is, is definitely not symmetric. 
it goes much farther above equilibrium than it ever goes below equilibrium. It goes that far below equilibrium, this far, but you know, above equilibrium. We will see, to, to, to foreshadow the world here, this kind of oscillation, which involves a, really a spring or a spring-like restoring force, one that's proportional to how far you pulled it away from equilibrium, there's a name for any oscillator that has that characteristic. It's called a harmonic oscillator. And, okay, if this doesn't stick, don't worry, we'll get back to it. Harmonic oscillators are technically the, like the best understood system in nature, period, by physicists. I mean, this, is, this is bread and butter for physicists. They're understood at every level, like way down into quantum physics and all that stuff, okay? They're very accessible to calculations and so on. And they have this fantastic characteristic that if they, if they are a harmonic oscillator, meaning that they, that they do have a spring-like restoring force, proportional to how far you take it away, the time it takes to go through a complete motion doesn't depend on how big that motion is. So whether, let me pick, let me get this guy set up and stuck. Whether I pluck this guy a little, or they pluck it a lot, it takes the same time to go through its motion. It's got a rhythm that doesn't depend on how big I pluck it. Is that okay? Now why would you care? If you're building a clock and you want it to keep time, you don't want, you don't want, you know, a pendulum is pretty nearly a harmonic oscillator. You don't want the clock to run slow if it swings big as opposed to little. It doesn't keep good time then because you can't really control how far that swing is. And if you want a musical instrument, and you don't want it to be twangy, you want it to, to you pluck the guitar, bing, at, at all volumes, bing, same tone. You don't want it to depend on how big, how big the pluck was, and therefore how loud it is. You want it to keep a consistent ry rhythm, and guitar strings, harmonic oscillators. All, basically all the musical instruments, with exceptions of things, the twangy instruments, bing, you know, that, that stuff. Th those, those guys have, uh, not quite harmonic oscillator behavior. This thing, definitely not a harmonic oscillator. The, the, rhythm, the rhythm starts slow and goes faster and faster and faster. Okay? So that, that, that's in our future, okay? Uh, anyway, the, the bouncing ball is another one of these systems swinging around equilibrium because of an inertial part fighting a, uh, an inertial part fighting a uh, uh, restoring force. Uh, when does an object start decelerating or slowing down? Before or after being at equilibrium? It's after. So if, 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 suppose I'm, I'm, I'm bungee jumping, relevant for the, for the problem set due on Friday. Suppose I'm bungee jumping and the cord attaches over there. We're bungee jumping horizontally, okay? Because I can't bungee jump vertically without a bungee jump cord. So I'm going to pretend I bungee, we rotate the world like this. And I'm, I'm going to leave the platform with a bungee cord there. I'm out in free fall, whoa, I'm falling faster and faster and faster. I, the, the bungee pulls taut, or, and it begins to slow me down. Now, nah, it begins to pull me backward, but it doesn't manage to pull hard enough to slow, to slow me down until after I go past equilibrium. That's the point at which, this is not very good, I'm, I'm, I'm confusing myself, and if that happens, you, you won't be able to follow me either. The point is, the, where I'm trying to go and answer this question is, is the bungee cord begins to slow me down. It finally, that's not true. The bungee cord begins to fight my motion when it pulls taut, but it doesn't slow me down yet. I'm still actually accelerating, and I should just leave the horizontal story. It sucks. Okay, <laughs> there's a the ball trying to come down on a bungee cord. As, as the, this is equilibrium. As the bungee cord gets more and more taut, and it begins to pull harder and harder in the ball, the ball is still accelerating downward because it's under-supported. It isn't until it actually, the ball actually reaches equilibrium that it finally is fully supported. We fully support you. you know, words I always wish I heard. But, um, it, so the ball gets there. It's coasting downward, however. It overshoots. And once it overshoots, it's over-supported. And for the first time, it's accelerating backwards. It's slowing down. So in answer to the question, when do you far, first start slowing down on a bungee cord? It's right after you go through equilibrium. 
And that does sound like one of these vague answers about like, you know, so where is right after? The, the instant after you leave equilibrium, down to all the digits you like, you are now accelerating upward. Not very much, but you are. Is that okay? All right. So there's bounce, this is, I've, I've, I think I've done justice to bouncing off of a surface that's not moving. Any questions about bouncing off a surface that's not moving? It's just rigid. The, re I, I know the reason I made that surface completely immobile is because I don't want the ball to be able to exchange any energy with it. What happens if the surface is not perfectly rigid? What happens if that surface is pliable, flexible? In that case, during the impact, the two objects, ball and um, surface, both dent. And in that case, they both have work done on them. Um, from whose frame of reference is kind of a messy thing, so I won't go into the details. But you can certainly see that if, if, two, if two balls, similar balls, hit each other, they're both obviously going to dent because they're both capable of doing that. And they're going to sh share the impact energy, the energy that was associated with their kinetic energies before and after collision, or before collision. So if they both dent, uh, the surface receives some, the key point is the surface receives some of the collision energy, the energy that was, that was in kinetic energy in the ball before the impact. And now what does the surface do with that energy? Different surfaces have different livelinesses. They're, they're not completely different from balls. Some surfaces are nice and lively, bouncy, they, they, they throw things back nicely, and some surfaces are, are dead. I, my, my term dead refers to not lively at all, they basically waste all the energy. Uh, an example of a lively surface would be a, a, a trampoline. This is sort of a, a trampoline for balls here. And it, my example of a dead surface is a sack of sand, a pile of sand. And because the surface now matters, uh, you can make balls that don't bounce well bounce well, and vice versa. Uh, for that to happen, though, you want the surface to receive a, a substantial fraction of the, of the energy during the, during when they hit when the ball on the surface hit. So you want to make that surface soft. If that surface is super rigid, even though it's lively, you don't get to see it because the surface doesn't receive very much energy. Remember, work is force. You, to do work on something, you exert a force on it, and it has to move a distance in the direction of the force. And the ball and the surface both push on each other, in fact, equally hard in opposite directions, and whichever one dents the most gets the most of the energy. So this guy is going to be pretty dentable, so is the sand. And as a result, I can take a ball that doesn't bounce, and if I drop it on, the, on a surface that is itself lively and relatively soft, you know, this guy loses air too fast, but I'll make it bouncier there. You know, it bounces OK. I mean, the extreme example is this, this thing, you know, trampoline. I'm not going to trampoline on it. I'll get out, you know, we'll end the semester right then and there. So this is a obviously underinflated basketball, doesn't bounce, worth beans. And if I drop it onto a surface that is significantly softer than the ball is and very lively, stores energy and returns it nicely, now we got a bouncing ball, right? You can make anything bounce on that surface, including people. People, we are terrible bouncers. Drop us on cement, okay? We do not bounce, but drop us on trampolines. And because it's softer than we are, and it dents deeply and returns the energy nicely, we bounce just fine on trampolines, or bounce houses, that kind of stuff. OK? So that's a, that's a dead, in fact, a dead, yeah, bad, bad use of language. A dead ball bouncing on a lively surface can bounce nicely. Same thing that a lively ball on a dead surface can bounce badly. So where's, where's happy ball? Here's happy ball which loves to bounce off of hard, rigid surfaces. But if you, if you let it try to bounce on sand, you're nothing. It did, the sand is too soft, it's soft, it dents deeply, gets almost all of the energy associated with the collision, and squanders it all. So nothing bounces off. Nothing bounces off the sand, except something that is bouncy and much softer than the sand. Like a beach ball, you can still bounce, bounce a beach ball off sand, because it's even softer than the sand. And it's lively enough that it'll bounce. Hence, yeah, that's why I have beach balls. Yeah, this is, we're, we're, we're going to work on a, on a, getting a ball that's a dead, a really massive dead ball. This is 
This is 25 pounds of ball bearings in a package. So this does not bounce. It's also, all right, no bounce. Bing! Okay, no problem. All right. Had to do it because I, I can. <laughs> all right. Okay, so that's, that's the effect of the surface on the bounce. What about other things about the surface? What if the surface is moving? So I started with a motionless, rigid surface. Then I had a motionless, dentable surface, and hopefully that's followable. What about a, a moving surface? I'll go back to rigid just to make it simple. If you've got a moving surface, you can do weird things. And here, I mean, here's an example just to, to set, set the stage. This ball doesn't bounce very well off of a motionless surface. But if it bounces off a, a, a rising surface, it goes way up high. You know, how did that happen? And this is a, a, a prototype idea of, of why a bat and a ball can send the ball so fast. And so let me try to walk through this story. Um, let me try to walk through the story in a way that you can follow. Before doing that, I'll ask you a couple of questions here just, just, just to get you thinking about objects where both of them are moving. And the question I'm going to ask is this one first. Might as well ask something. Two cars are traveling at 50 miles an hour, and 60 miles an hour and 50 miles an hour, respectively. That's their speeds, OK, uh, as viewed by somebody on the sidewalk. When those two cars collide, their collision speed will be, which is the speed with which one car approaches the other car. Uh, you know, if, if you're in one of the cars watching, OK, we're, you know, we'll, we'll keep you safe. But you're in one of the cars watching the other car come at you. How fast is it coming at you? And again, I told you only speed. I didn't tell you anything else about the, what the cars are doing. You OK with the question? Question to the question? See what you think here. Make sure you think, you know, in effect, outside the box here. I didn't tell you which side of the road the two cars are on. Imagine it's on a, on a two-lane road or something like that. Are they both on opposite lanes? Ooh, I'm seeing some evolution from wrong to right. This is good. All right, just for fun, I'll let you see what you're choosing as we go, OK? You guys can now can, I like the E. Yeah, E is good. <laughs> I didn't tell you which way the cars were headed. So this could be a fast-moving car overtaking a slow-moving car in the same lane, both heading to Richmond, but one's going faster. In which case, the speed of approach is going to be 10 miles an hour. That's the impact speed. If, however, they could also be a head-on collision between, between two cars in opposite lanes, one heading away from Richmond at, at say, 60, and the other heading toward Richmond at 50. That's 110 miles an hour. OK, so, so just to answer the question here, the answer is C, it's between 10 miles an hour and, and 110. We don't know which way they're going, according to the question. And if it's head-on, this is a disaster. The, the speed with which these two cars are coming at each other sums to 110 miles an hour. That means if you're in one watching the other car come at you, it's 110 miles an hour, and, up, and, and the other car will agree. On the other hand, if it's an overtaking accident, it's a 10 mile an hour collision. It's a, just a little fender bender. This is why, OK, public service now, but you've got a choice. I mean, you're in a situation where you're, you're going to hit a car. Ah, things, go, things are going wrong. Uh, the cars in front of you have slowed down, and you're going to hit those cars from behind in your lane, that's going to be a slow-moving collision. The alternative is to veer into the oncoming traffic and get hit by oncoming cars. That's going to be a high-speed collision. Never do it, OK? If you hit the cars in your lane going forward from you, 
typically it's going to be a couple miles an hour, 10, 5, 10, 20. It's going to be a way less trouble. Uh, don't hold me to this, but if you've got a, a you know, split second to decide and you're going to hit something, don't hit something that's coming at you uh, at, closing, at some sort of closing speed. All right? Let me get the, the next question is this one. How about the energy involved? Let me get this out of here. Same, same question. Compare the, what, what, over what range of energies are sort of released by these impacts? Again, 10 miles an hour all the way up to 110. What, what are the range of, of kinetic? You remember, you're working with kinetic energy, which goes as the square of speed. Boy, low voting. <laughs> yeah, no, okay. it, they're all over the map here. It's, I mean, think, think of something coming at you. It's got two choices, 10 miles an hour or 110 miles an hour. Which one is carrying more energy, and by how, what lar how large a factor is, is the energy of, the, of for example, the fast-moving one boosted? Remember, energy is kinetic energy is proportional to speed squared. All right, it, it's, it's, it's not getting, getting uh, better fast. There, there, there's a look at it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, A again. <laughs> The answer is D. It's a factor of 121. Oh, boy, you guys are brilliant. <laughs> the, the reason for this is that if something's coming at you, I'll see, okay, come back to live here. If something is coming at you at 10 miles an hour, from your perspective, it is carrying energy that's proportional to 10 miles an hour squared, 10 squared. If it comes at you 10 times as fast, actually it's 11 times as fast at, at 110 miles an hour, it's carrying 110 miles an hour squared worth of energy. The, the other details, the proportionality is not so important, but that's a factor of 11 between low speed and high speed. It's a factor of 11 in speed, which we, when you square is a factor of 121 in energy. And, and this is why the high speed Head-on collisions are terrible. The, the, little, the, the going the same direction collisions are, are dramatically less uh, trouble, assuming you, nothing else happens. You, questions about that idea? So things that are, that are coming at each other, they have a lot of energy uh, compared to the, the, their sort of individually. And where that's going to go, and now, I'll, now so I'm now come back, is, is with a batted ball. And let me, let me unclip this guy for the second and just walk you through how, how a ball and a bat work. And let me, let me make a simplifying assumption. Let me assume, let me, let me use a, a, a perfectly bouncy ball. So if a perfectly bouncy ball comes in at 100 kilometers an hour, I'll just pick a, pick a speed. I mean, I, I know my units are, are random. 100, 100 kilometers an hour, it comes in off of a rigid and movable surface and it's perfectly bouncy, it's going to leave at 100 kilometers an hour. It just, bing, bounces, it's back at business as usual. But what happens if the bat's moving? Suppose the bat is also moving at 100 kilometers an hour in the other direction. From the perspective of the bat, so you're a fly on the bat watching the ball come at you, it's not moving 100 kilometers an hour because you're on a moving surface. It's coming at 200 kilometers an hour, any questions about the fact that it's 200 kilometers an hour? That's the approaching speed of these two, these two as they're coming at each other? So it comes in at 200 kilometers an hour. You're still on the bat as a bug. And the ball's perfectly bouncy. It bounces off at 200 kilometers an hour. Came in at 200, leaves at 200. All right? But stop, let's stop being a bug. Let's, let's go back to the stands and watch the bat. Oh. From, this, from the stands 
in, the, in the, the, the people in the stands point of view, the bat isn't actually motionless. The bounce was correctly viewed by, by, some, by the bug on the bat. But from the people in the stands point of view, the bat itself is moving to your right at 100 kilometers an hour. So the ball is truly leaving the bat surface at, 100, at 200 kilometers an hour, but the bat surface is moving at 100 kilometers an hour. You have to add them to see what the, what the fans in the stands are seeing. It's three, the ball itself is moving at 300 kilometers an hour as viewed by the people in the stands. This is a lot easier. Why didn't I figure this out a long time? We keep holding a bat like that, okay? Bing, okay. So I'll walk you through it one more time here. Both of them are, are coming toward each other. 100, each one's going individually as viewed by you guys in the stands, 100 kilometers an hour. They both hit, the ball bounces. How much does the ball bounce? To, do, to figure that out, we have to go on the bat and pretend it's motionless. So if we're on it, it from our perspective, it is motionless, and now we see the ball do, carrying all that speed. It's, the ball, from our perspective, and I'll, I'll move with the bat. It's, there, it's coming at 200 kilometers an hour, bing! It's leaving at 200 kilometers an hour. But if you shift back to your frame of reference, yeah, the ball's leaving the bat at 200 kilometers an hour, but the bat is moving in the same direction at 100. You add them. That's 300 kilometer per hour ball. Questions? This is how balls go so, so fast in any sport that involves hitting, hitting a ball with a moving object, whether it's a bat, whether it's your foot in soccer. It's a bounce, but it's a bounce off a moving object. And, and you get this, this, these interesting relative motion effects and, and very and tremendous bounces as a result. Uh, the, the opposite is also true, that is, that if you have the ball and the bat, ah, the ball and the bat, and they're moving in somewhat the same direction, like in a bunt, you know, you, when, when, when you, in baseball, the bunt is let the ball hit and actually maybe even pull back on the bat, so the ball approaches the bat very slowly. Their closing speed is, is, is inches per hour, you know, nothing. There's a little dinky bounce off a of backward moving bat, and the ball just sort of drops. All right? Yeah, Alex. Why was it 11 instead of 10? It's because in this particular question, the slowest speed you, that's available in the story is, is 10 miles an hour. This, the difference between 60 and 50. The highest effective available speed is 110 miles an hour. The sum of those two speeds, when that's a head-on collision. That's a factor of 11 in diff speed, between 10 and 110. That's a, so it's a factor of 11. And you square that because we're, we're looking at the energy involved, the kinetic energy, and it's the square of the speeds. That's, that's the 121, which is, it looks like a crazy number pulled out of, out of uh, thin air, but it's, it's not. And so in a, in a sport like baseball, which is the one that sort of uses a, as a, I, I, I built that, that, chap, that, that section about, in baseball, you can start with, a, with the ball moving towards home plate and the bat moving toward the pitcher in you know, opposite directions. They're closing speeds. Individual, individually, neither one is moving faster than, say, 100 miles an hour. However, after the bounce, it is possible for the ball to be moving towards the bleachers out in the distance faster than either the bat or the ball were moving originally. We actually can have something end up with, with much, much higher speed than anything with, that was present prior in the story. Is that okay? All right. Uh, one thing you can, you can observe from this is, is that when you hit something like, like, a, like a, a baseball with a bat, the faster the ball was moving as it came in, the faster it'll be moving as it go, came out, because it's a bounce. So if, if, if you're, whether you're hitting a ball with a bat or whether you're kicking a, a, a ball with your leg in soccer, or you're hitting with your hand in, in volleyball, it, you, if you want that ball to go, be going really fast, after it leaves your hand or your foot or your bat, you, you hope it was coming at you very fast because you're going to, it'll go out faster as a result because of the bounce. All right? Last thing to talk about is the, uh, the bat itself. With your leg, not, it's not 
you know, your, your leg has interesting effects too if you kick the ball or hit you with your hand. But a bat in particular does. The bat, first off, the bat doesn't have infinite mass. It doesn't have infinite rotational mass. And so where the ball hits it and how can affect the bat. So if the ball, for example, the ball hits the very tip of the bat, it will, well, if the ball hits the bat at all, it's going to transfer momentum to the bat. And that will change the bat's forward motion. So you were swinging it along and having the ball hit it uh, transfers backward momentum to it. Simple as that. Where the ball hits can, can produce torques on the bat and cause it to change to get an anger impulse. So the bat can respond by rotating after the ball hits it. And these all matter. And, and so, so where you hit the ball affect how the handle jerks around and stuff. And that's interesting, but I'm going to leave that one alone just for time. The bat has a third thing it can do. Apart from just accelerating or undergoing anger acceleration, it can also vibrate. The bat is not infinitely rigid. And you can actually get the thing vibrating back and forth the same way that a, a xylophone plate vibrates. So, th so th imagine this is the world's longest xylophone. You had a little Fisher Price xylophone, or, your, or you know, some, some kid around you had that you know, ding, 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 okay? And the motion in a xylophone of, a, of the plate is a flapping motion. It goes from flapping up like this to flapping down, back and forth, back and forth like that. And there are two points that stay put when that flapping occurs. And my hands are about there. Those points that stay put are known as nodes. Okay, so those are the nodes for, for the flapping motion. And I can get the flapping motion going. Ooh, there it is. I can't do it by holding the nodes. I just won't be able to, to pull it off. But okay, so I get the flapping motion going. There is flapping motion available to bat. And actually, it's, yeah. And you can't see it because the thing is so much stiffer. But it, it flaps the same way. The middle goes up, the, the ends go down, and then vice versa, back and forth. And if you get that flapping motion going aggressively enough, you can break the bat. And how do you do that? Hit the bat right on the label. You know, they put the label right here in right the proper place on the grain so that if you hit the ball hard right there, it will vibrate violently and it will in all likelihood break the, you know, you've got a good chance of breaking the bat. Can you hear it? Can you hear that sound? Let me hang it so you can hear it. I'm, I'm wasting energy with my hand, and so you don't hear the good, the, the good vibrations here, right? You know, bad xylophone. Can you hear the, 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 the ping? OK. So that's the, the worst place to hit it. You get the flapping motion going violently. Energy is involved in that flapping motion. So if you hit, if the ball hits there, it doesn't bounce very well, because a lot of the energy goes into that vibration. Bad choice. The red, the red label, I believe, is one of the nodes. It's not placed the same as on a xylophone time because it's not uniform. The bat's obviously not a xylophone time. But at this point, no vibration. Do you hear that? It's, it's quite, here's the vibration. Here's the. And if you hit the bat, if the ball hits the bat right there, at that vibrational node, no vibration occurs, which is good for your hands, because the batter feels that. And the other thing is that the ball goes farther. So people who have played baseball for a while get used to listening for the impact. If they hear a big bzzz sound, then the, the bat's got a lot of the energy, and the ball won't go very far. If they hear the smack sound, they know that the, bat, the ball was hit properly, not on the not on, a, uh, on the vibrational node, no energies in the bat, the ball's going to go farther. All right, with that then, we'll stop. We'll come back to carousels and roller coasters a bit on Friday.